Okay, and we're off to the races, but it never hurts to go with the acid flow, so let's keep track of the acid and figure out where there are race condition opportunities. So the first thing is that I didn't exactly tell you what was acid, but I did say that you should assume that user space is fully compromised, and we know that system calls are a call from user space to kernel space, and I told you that this function was user space code. So therefore, you should assume that all of the inputs to a system call are fully attacker controlled. So this handler, the handler GUID, context size, context, and handler GUID. So there's going to be two system calls, each of which has a different type. So the first is unreg1 and the second is unreg2. So this has something to do with unregistering a handler, some sort of mechanism by which, you know, user space SMM would say, hey, dear kernel, you know, please call me. I've got this handler that I want to have called. But this is specifically the code for when it would unregister. Now, it doesn't necessarily need to be naturally called. If the attacker just breaks into user space and SMM, they don't have to just call this function, they can just call these system calls themselves in any order with any parameters. But here we'll just consider, you know, assume that they just wanted to write less code and they just invoked this as is. What would occur and where is the race condition here? Okay, so we've got user space code, we've got that first system call, and it has handler GUID, which is a pointer to an EFI GUID, that's 16 byte data structure, globally unique identifier. It's got handler, which is a pointer to some sort of SMI handler code, basically saying, please invoke this code on some particular condition. And then the third parameter was zero. So those parameters are gonna be passed through the system call up to kernel space. And what does kernel space do with it? Well, inside of the system call dispatcher, which has cases for all of the different system calls, we can see that both unreg1 and unreg2 both fall through to the same code. So what happens here? We've got argument one, argument two, argument three. Those are the attacker controlled arguments, although we know that three is just zero. So then we've got argument one being passed into inspect target range ownership. Well, that's got an interesting name and it's got an interesting parameter, which is, is user range. So this is checking, okay, well, the argument one, which is the pointer to the GUID, is that inside of user space? because this is a super appropriate thing to do. The kernel wants to make sure that if user space passes it a pointer, that that doesn't point into kernel space because that could potentially lead to the kernel using the pointer, using it to write somewhere, and then all of a sudden you've tricked the kernel into clobbering its own memory. So this is a super appropriate check. Is it uh, pointing in user space? So we're gonna mark this as sassy for reasons I'll show in a second because although the contents that it points to is acid, the address itself is not acid, so it's sassy. And then that gets passed in as long as, you know, it doesn't have an error there. As long as it does make sure that it is pointing in user space, then it gets passed into this next function. So sassy argument, acid argument, acid argument. So just to visualize here that uh, check for user space, that handler GUID is really the uh, argument one at this point. And it's saying, okay, well, let me go ahead and check that that is targeting inside of user space. If so, that's all good. But if the attacker placed this in such a way that it actually was pointing into kernel space, well, that's the kind of thing that we want to deny. All right, so that next function that was called was process user handler unreg. And we've got that sassy pointer that points at acid content and acid GUID, but it has to point in user space. Then we've got the argument two, which was the pointer to the SMI handler code and argument three, which was zero. Okay, so just some checking of properties, which, you know, I didn't tell you anything about that. So you can basically just ignore it. Assume that the attacker can make that succeed and continue on through to this code. Now we have a switch saying if the case is unreg one, then it's going to zero out the memory of some holder and it's going to take that sassy handler GUID, put it into the handler GUID field of that holder. It's going to take argument two, which was the pointer to SMI code, put it into the handler field. And then the system call index itself is just this right here and put that into the completed system call. Okay, so up here, basically we've got handler GUID is going to be placed into this zeroed out user handler reg holder. So this is global memory. If you had uh, looked around, if you looked at the, origi at the original code, you would see that this is global memory. And so in this global, the handler GUID is going to be set to point at this user space data. Then the handler is set to point at the user space SMI handler code. 
and then the completed syscall is set to that on reg one. Okay, well, continuing down, uh, we can see that if the system call two was called, then, so so the interesting thing about that first thing is that, you know, basically it set a completed system call kind of implying that that is all that the first system call does. It sets up that global to point at the user space stuff, and then it says, okay, this has now completed the unreg one. Then if you called again and you called into this unreg two, you would hit this code. So this code is going to compare the memory for when the, the system call two is called, it's going to say, okay, does my global handler GUID equal the new system call two handler GUID uh, that's coming in? So the attacker, you know, once again, provided a sassy uh, pointer pointing at ACID data. Uh, and now it's saying, okay, well, I know that basically what this is all trying to enforce is that, you know, it makes sure that system call one is called before system call two and that when system call two is called, that the handler GUID from the system call one is pointing at whatever the handler GUID is passed into system call two. Okay, so the attacker can guarantee that that will actually be completed. And then it's going to take the handler GUID from the second system call and stick it and overwrite uh, the value that was already there. Well, since they're explicitly supposed to be the same, that does a whole bunch of nothing. And then argument two is now context. It's not actually pointing at uh, code to be executed. It's going to be pointing at some context, some data. And then argument three is the size of the context data. And now it's saying, okay, I just completed this on reg two system call. So what does that do? Well, pass up those three parameters, handler GUID, context, context size. So we've got some context data in play here now. The handler GUID is the argument one, and that's just placed into the same place as before. So that does nothing. That points at the same thing. Then context is pointed, this argument two, context is pointed at the context data that was passed in. Argument three, which is the acid value, the context size is placed in here. And then the completed system call is set to unreg two. So after proceeding through that code, it's now going to move down here. It's going to check some information about the context region. And we're not going to really care about this. It's just, again, like some user space sanity check to make sure that the thing is in user space. So the attacker needs to make sure that that's going to be true. And, you know, effectively, that's what makes that sassy now. And as long as it's uh, in user space range, then it'll continue down to this code, the SMI handler profile unregister handler. Okay, so this code is now going to take the handler GUID, that's the specific handler that's going to be looked up to be unregistered, going to take the handler, that is the code that was being pointed at that needs to be unregistered and should no longer be handling a system management interrupt the context and the context size. Okay, so this is all essentially fully attacker controlled values other than the fact that it has to be in user space and they can't just play the game of trying to clobber kernel space. So when those parameters are passed through to SMI handler profile on register handler, what do we have in here? Well, we've got, first of all, this uh, handler GUID being used for SMM core find hardware SMI entry. So some sort of lookup that then passes back the SMI entry, which was presumably registered at some point in the past. That context is placed into the search context and the context size is the search context size. If the context is not null, which obviously the attacker can easily ensure that's true, then we've got a compare GUID and this is going to be the crux of the vulnerability. And it's, uh, I just want to preface it by saying it's a very easy vulnerability for EFI developers to get themselves into because under normal context for UEFI, uh, the firmware is all just one big flat address space. There's no user space, kernel space separation. So this sort of paradigm of comparing GUIDs is exactly what you would normally see in normal UEFI code. It says, okay, I've got a pointer to one GUID. Let me compare it against, you know, some hard-coded constant, some global GUID that I know has to do with some particular thing. In this case, you know, SMM USB dispatch to whatever that is, or in this case, uh, software dispatch to whatever that is. So they've got some globals and normally they would say, okay, the user's handing me some value for a GUID and I need to compare it against some global known GUID. And if it's that, then do something. And if it's not, do something else. Normal programming paradigm for UEFI, but it all falls down once you start having privilege separation. 
because this global is compared against this attacker controlled in user space GUID, but that is effectively a fetch one from the handler GUID pointer. So now we're starting to work our way towards double fetch situations and specifically talk to situations because this is basically trying to say, do the check and say, if it is exactly equal to this, then I'm going to do this. And if it's exactly equal to that, then I'm going to do that. So we've got checking and conditionality for the control flow coming into play here. But because this handler GUID is pointing out to user space memory that could potentially be swapped out if there's any sort of context switching or multi-processing going on, that is setting up an opportunity for a race condition. So I had to look this up, but apparently races start with green flags, but there is no green flag emoji, only a checkered flag for the finishing races. So I had to pick a green looking flag and I landed on Zambia. So congrats and shout outs go out to our Zambian students watching this class. Also, yes, Apple, I see what you did there. You got a little Swift logo on your race car. Ah, ha, ha. Okay, well, anyways, we've got that first fetch and the attacker makes it so that that is not true right here. And they continue on to this next fetch. We've got a second fetch coming up here. And once again, kernel space is dereferencing a user space pointer and pulling in data to do a comparison. So what that would look like is we've got that context, which is the SASE pointer pointing out here to the context data in user space. We've got the context size, which is acid right here, that argument three. And we've got the data being pulled in in the compare GUID function four bytes at a time. And it's going to compare and say, is this equal to this global EFI SMM USB dispatch to protocol GUID, right? Is that the case? And in this case, the attacker wants that not to be the case. So on the first fetch, that will not be the case. But I'll just uh, tell you up front right here on the third fetch, that is what the attacker wants to be true. So they make sure it's not true here. And then later on, if they can swap out the context and make it be true later on, that has uh, advantage for the attacker, right? And the second instance invocation compare GUID, it is taking again four bytes pulled in from user space at a time, 16 bytes total, and saying, is it equal to this other global? And the attacker once again wants that not to be the case quite yet, because again, they're going to swap it out for this value later on. Okay, so then it goes through the code and you can see there's all this linked list processing and essentially you know searching a linked list for, to find the handler that it ultimately wants to unregister but we're gonna forward on to this this is going to be the third fetch so if the search context is not null and it gets in here and it does another compare guid once again pulling in from the handler guid exact same one and comparing it to this usb dispatch to protocol and that is what the first fetch was on. So you can see in the code between the first fetch and the third fetch, the attacker could potentially change out this user space data to instead have the data that does now match the USB dispatch to protocol GUID. And if it does match on the third fetch, then it will fall through to this free pool on the search context. So this is the end of the race. The attacker switches it out. Beginning of the race is up here right above where we're seeing end of the race is right here. And if they switch it out in between there, then they will be able to pass a sassy pointer into the free pool function. So that is going to be a sassy free. And we'll talk a little bit in a second about why that could be beneficial to an attacker. But visualizing it, we've got this situation and the attacker has somehow won this race and they have swapped in the four bytes at a time, 16 bytes total. That would ultimately lead to a comparison against this global USB dispatch to protocol GUID equaling true this time instead of false. And if it is true, then the attacker will call free pool on this sassy location. Again, it's fully attacker controlled data, but the pointer itself has to be in user space. So basically we could see that if this pointer could be in kernel space, that could be leading to a really bad time for kernel space code if all of a sudden some data just disappeared out from underneath it. That could lead to the sort of use after free vulnerabilities that we talk about later on in this class. But in this context, the interesting thing here, you know, it's always going to be dependent upon an allocator. But the interesting thing here would be, how is this allocator going to behave when it is past a user space pointer in kernel space? Is it going to just properly completely error out? 
Is it going to take that user space location and stick it on the free list in kernel space? And consequently, later on, when kernel space asks for an allocation, it's going to get an address of some user space location that the attacker can control the contents of. So, you know, you'd have to go dig deeper into here. And for now, we don't care to do that. But, uh, but this is just an example of when you do this sort of manipulation of, you know, across privilege boundaries and utilization of attacker controlled values in freeze. Uh, this can cause problems for the allocator. So what type of vulnerability was this? Well, the hint is in the title. It is a talk to vulnerability. There is a time of check. There is a point at which it does a compare GUID that is checking for the data type. And if the data is one type, it's going to do one thing. And if it's a different type, it's going to do something else. But then there is the later on time of use, which is really actually, again, a time of check and then another time of check and then a time of use. So basically the, the second check is the you know time of actual use by the attacker changing the usage at that point to change the control flow. So what was the fix for this vulnerability? Well, this was a relatively simple fix and it is just copying that GUID, that handler GUID, that attacker controlled value kernel space should copy that into a location that is non-raceable. Specifically in this case, they chose to stick it into a local variable. The attacker in user space has absolutely no access to the local variables, the stack space of kernel space, and consequently the attacker can no longer race. So copy the GUID into a local variable and then pass the address of that local variable instead of using that uh, global pointer pass the address of the local variable and then that is what will be compared against and there will be no more opportunities for racing. So looks good to me. So just to visualize that, you essentially have this copy mem temp quid. Temp quid is some stack memory that the attacker can't control. Copy that up to there and now that will be used for the comparisons. And at no point will the attacker have the opportunity to change out the value in the stack memory.